On today's Join Us in France, a trip report with Phil Robertson, who is extraordinarily well-informed about D-Day sites and what makes a great visit to Normandy. This is Join Us in France, episode 116. Hello, I'm Annie, and Join Us in France is a show about all things French, or edutainment about France. I love France, I was born and raised here, I live in France, but I've also lived in the UK and the US for a couple of decades, so I have a unique perspective on my own country. I want to help you understand France better. And to do that today, I bring you an interview with an extraordinary person who knows a lot about Normandy, the landings, D-Day, and Operation Overlord. He has visited Normandy on several occasions, and he has seen many of the places that people can visit so they can pay respect or remember the events of June 6, 1944. He is very well read about the time period and shares a lot of his favorites to visit in Normandy. Hello, Phil. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you so much for talking to me. Yeah, my pleasure. My I pleasure. Look, been looking forward to it. I have been looking through your notes. Oh, my goodness. You have been busy. Uh, it was kind of a busy vacation, but <laughs> I like it that way. It was good. <laughs> a lot of sights to see. You just got home just a few days ago, right? Yeah, got in on Thursday. So I'm back onto our our time zone and mostly unpacked and all that stuff. Excellent, excellent. Okay, <laughs> well, let's let's jump right into it. Sure. Can you tell us just a tiny bit about you, who you are, uh, why your interest for France, etc.? Ah, uh, uh, well, that's a. I could take an hour saying that, but I won't. Um, I'm. Uh, I live in the states. I've always had an interest in history in general, and I guess a particular interest in World War II history. I have an, an uncle who died in the Pacific, um, and I had a, a very influential person in my life. My first job when I was in middle school, uh, my boss was a World War II paratrooper, and his oh. first combat ever was jumping into France on D-Day. Oh, and that, wow. So that sparked a lot of interest in my mind about, uh, about the history of the, the war, that area, skydiving in general, uh, all sorts of things like that. Right, right. Yes, and I, that's, that's one of your hobbies, isn't it? Is sky, it's more than a hobby, probably, because you've done a lot of it. Yeah, I, I worked as a professional skydiver for years, and I still jump occasionally whenever I can, uh, whenever my current work allows but yeah, it's it's a lot of fun, and it's a it's something that it's not for everyone. But if anybody's ever thought, "Geez, I want to try that," I think it would be a lot of fun. Those people would enjoy it. Right. Whereas the people that say, "I could never do it," "I can never imagine it," don't do it. Don't do it for a friend or for a spouse or anything like that. Just stay on the ground. You'll have more fun watching it. That is probably very good advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine. You know, I have a hard time at the second floor of the Eiffel Tower. For <laughs> so yeah. I can't skydive. There's no way. Oh, yeah, that's great. That's great. So you you go by the by the handle uh, Farmer Phil. Are you a farmer or do you no? On I, TV? <laughs> I just I just I used to play one in a in a previous life. I had a gentleman's farm. Nothing um, uh, nothing that elaborate, but that was just a nice handle that I found on Skype and decided to use it. And several people actually several people at the drop zone use that term. They <laughs> refer to me Farmer great. Phil, so I caught on. That's great. That's great. Uh, so today's yeah. episode, we're going to be talking about Normandy and all the great sites that you've visited in Normandy. Yes. I've seen a few of them, but you've seen a lot more than I have, to tell you the truth. So I look forward to hearing about that. Yeah, I've gone there. Uh, this was my fifth trip, I think. Yeah, fifth wow. trip. Uh, and my, f let me think about this, the third on an anniversary, or fourth on an anniversary of D-Day. Wow. Uh and I, you know, I originally went there for the history, and that's still something that gets me back there and why I go on the anniversary. 
But I ended up falling in love with the area. I mean, it is just a beautiful part of the country, a beautiful part of the world. And some friends of mine who don't understand why I keep going back, I, I just say it pretty simply. If you told me that I couldn't live in the U.S. anymore and I had to pick somewhere else to live, it would be Normandy because it's just a beautiful area. It's uh, rural. Um, uh, it's got the ocean. It's got these beautiful pastoral farm scenes and these old, old stone Norman villages. So, yeah, I just fell in love with the area, and, and I it keeps – keeps uh, bringing me back there. That's great. That's great. Okay. So you sent me a really nice outline of some of the things that you that you want to talk about. First, let's do a little bit of background on D-Day. What happened on that day? We did an episode about that. I think it was 27 or something with yep. these, but it was you know, over it was probably 2 years ago by now. So uh, let's do a little bit of uh, a refresher on that. Some some facts about what happened on D-Day. Yeah, and I think that's important, particularly for visitors that want to go see these sites, is to know at least a little bit about the history uh, of the battle. Um, it was a huge battle. It was the largest ever as far as you know, men and, and ships and uh, planes and material, and I theorize the largest there will ever be because you wouldn't be able to keep something that large under wraps in this day and age. Uh, so it would, And it was really the Allies... You know, first, well, it was a, really the Allies' entree into Northern Europe uh, to push Nazi Germany out of Northern Europe. So it was all the Allied countries. It was, and I'll probably miss some, but it was mostly U.S., U.K., France. Um, there were small units from Poland. Excuse me, uh, U.S., U.K., Canada. Small units from France um, and Belgium and Poland, which were, of course were already occupied by Germany, and they basically landed on the northern shore of Normandy, uh, northern shore of France, and the, the invasion, and I want to get back to that word in a little while, but the area uh, covered a huge amount of ground. Uh, there were five mm -hmm. seaborne landing areas, five beaches um, from the west. There were Utah and then Omaha, which were the two American beaches, then Gold, which was a U.K. beach, uh, Juneau, which was a Canadian beach, and then Sword, which was also a U.K. beach. So those beaches are 45 miles apart as the crow flies. So that kind of gives you a, an idea of the width of the operation. And then on the western and eastern flanks, they dropped airborne troopers to secure the flanks of the area. Um, so it's a gigantic area, and I think anybody that goes there to visit needs to understand that because it's not like going to one city and you can stay in your hotel and, and walk out to all the different sites. You really need to get around and to be able to see and to be able to cover a little bit of ground. Right, and how did you do that? Did you did you book uh, like a, a tour with a tour guide and a bus and all that? Or? I did it by myself, and I, I think you can do it both ways. Um, the one way you can't do it is via public transportation, because there really are no, um, there is no public transportation to most of the sites. Um, so you need. It's really rural, and there's no, you know, I don't know if there's bus service, but if there is, it isn't regular, and it doesn't go everywhere. Uh, I've read really good reviews, a lot of the tours. Um, I've always gone by myself using a car, and I, I think there's probably both ways are a good way to do it. I think if, you're, if you know a little bit about the history and you're comfortable driving in another country, a car is a great way to do it. If you don't know the history that well um, or you're a little intimidated by driving, then I'd say take a tour because the tour guides, all the reviews I've read are, are great, and they give you a lot of insight that you may not have. Um, and they're going to hit the big spots, you know, the, the, the major locations there. <laughs> sure, sure. And how many days would you say you have to spend to get a decent feel for what happened? Well, I, I would say at least two or three days. I know a lot of people try to do it as a trip out of, out of Paris for a day or a night. And, you know, you can't do it. In my mind, you can't do it as a day. You'd have to at least spend the night. And you'd be rushing around and you'd probably miss a lot of the sites. Uh, like I say, it's a huge area. Um, and most yeah. people tend Yeah, probably in a day you'd just go see yeah. one site. I mean, you'd probably go to... Yeah, the Omaha Beach, Beach and the American Cemetery and maybe one other... Um, and, you know, I think... Yeah, Utah Beach is... Yeah, it is. And a lot of people that go there only for a day or two miss it. And I think they miss out on some wonderful sites and some wonderful history because that was where the American Airborne uh, dropped. There was no Airborne around Omaha Beach. So, um, but it does take a little, it's about a 40-minute drive from the American Cemetery above Omaha Beach to Utah Beach. So, you know, it does take a little covering some ground. 
And I think people typically, you know, Americans go there are going to want to see the American beaches and Brits are going to want to see the British beaches, et cetera. And, and that's, that's normal. But if you really had time and wanted to, you know, see the whole area, uh, you could spend several days. I was there for about, I guess, in Normandy for about seven days on this trip. Uh, uh, so total, how many days have you spent there with all your... Ooh, uh, maybe almost a month, I guess, because the last few times I've, I've wow. spent about seven days each time. Uh, maybe a little less, because I, I always try to include something else. Like four years ago, I went to Mont Saint-Michel, um, which is you know still Normandy, although a little further away. Uh, and the, like I say, there are other things to see there other than just the D-Day sites. But that's obviously a big draw for most people right. that, that visit that area. Right, because by the time you're at Mont Saint Michel, you're away from all yes. the Normandy landing type areas. It's it's yeah. that's tourist area. It's well, <laughs> yeah. France is still Normandy, but it's not where where yeah. the World and, War Two. And actually, there were you know the the Battle of Normandy is really considered from D Day up until uh, the retaking of Paris, which was in September. So it really encompasses the whole area, um, and there are you know sites all over Normandy. But I think most people's initial interest is going to be in the landing beaches and the airborne areas where the initial initial assault uh, took place. Right, right. So, how would you organize if you were giving advice to your to your some friends who want to do this? How would you tell them to get you know? I, I think the first thing you'd want to do is decide whether you want to drive yourself or do a tour. Because if you want to do a tour, you really need to book those. My understanding is you need to book them. Uh, pretty far in advance because a lot of the better tour companies do book up in the summer and certainly around the anniversary of D-Day they, yeah. they book ahead um, and if you are comfortable driving actually whether you do a tour or whether you drive I think it would really help to just get some basic history of it you know get one book on uh, the D-Day battles, so you understand some things. You don't, you know, get back and find out about something that happened and think, boy, we're just a block from there and I didn't even know about it, uh, because there are sites all over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's always that's always terrible. It's happened to me many times, you know. You're like, yeah. oh, I was so close and I just didn't yeah. know about it in time. You know, that's that's kind of that's kind of the fear of the trip over planner. Uh, yeah. I am and I suppose you are. Most of the people, I suspect, who listen to the show yeah, if they're listening, so it's because they want to make sure they make the right decisions for sure. <laughs> and, right, right. So, so obviously, it's it's really annoying when that happens. So, yeah, reading a book. Do you have um, a book recommendation? There are several. Uh, Stephen Ambrose, a late historian, did a lot of books about World War II, and he did one just titled D-Day. That's mostly about the American operations there, uh, and it's a great book. It's an easy read. He's a, a fabulous writer and a fabulous historian. Uh, there's another one which is a little larger that I'm in the middle of reading now that's really interesting, um, also called D-Day by Anthony Beaver. And I, I think maybe he's British, uh, but I'm not sure. But that encompasses the whole, you know, the, the all sides, really, uh, not just the Allies, but from the German perspective as well. Uh, but it's something that's a good, good overview, like Stephen Ambrose's book, is great because you'll get an idea of the layout, idea of the scale and the time. But you'll still expect to be surprised when you go there. I remember one of the first times I went, I was pretty far inland, and I'd just gone to a town market to get some food for a picnic, and I pulled over by this this beautiful, huge farm field. And right before I pulled over, I had passed a monument. So when I was done with my lunch, I went, I walked back to the monument to see what it was for, and apparently this field I was looking at was the site of a huge air base, uh, that was built right after the Allies landed in Normandy, and you know, no less than Churchill and um, Eisenhower and I believe De Gaulle landed at this airstrip. But it's, it's nothing there but a monument now. Oh, wow. And there's a lot of sites like that. Just driving down the road, you'll see a, a little marker um, that maybe a tribute to some particular battle or some significant, you know, military hospital that was put in place there or something like that. So, you know, learn all you can about history, but expect to be surprised and learn things too while you're there. Yeah, yeah, and it's true. There are monuments everywhere, and obviously, yes. the has moved on, and people have, you know. Removed a lot of old uh, yeah. things that I mean, you know. Yeah, I although I, it's, it's funny. I've seen. I, I remember driving along, and there was a, a farm field that, with, that was fenced in for cattle, and right by the gate, there was a piece of metal that looked interesting, and I looked at it, and it was 
It was a prefabricated piece of sheet metal that they made in huge quantity that they'd use to make an airstrip. They'd just plow a field and lay these things down. And obviously some farmer who had probably been deprived for years of decent raw materials, you know, when the war was over, said, oh, I'm going to start building fences out of this. Uh, you see things that aren't even like signposts <laughs> or, or monuments. That, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, they they have a lot of remnants, and they, you know, French people, they're pretty. Yeah, good at and I think particularly the the Norman farmers, you know, they're they seem like a hardy bunch, and. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, so the advice is to read some at least a good one good book, maybe two if you have the time, maybe some movie. Uh, yeah, actually, um, there was a there was a great book, and I forgot to mention it, um, called The Longest Day, and I believe it was in the early 60s maybe and it's actually a very good book about d-day um and it covers it from all sides of the battle uh and then there's, yeah and they, i was gonna say they made a movie out of it which is which is really good and it's really all in, encompassing there are other movies that are very good that i like that are about d-day but they don't they don't cover everything there's um you know saving private ryan which is really uh, a historical novel but based on you know, similar things that happened, but it doesn't cover all the areas or all the, uh, no, right, no. It's, it's, not... comprehensive. it's just a one story yeah. about the uh, Band of Brothers was a series on HBO that's available on DVD and Blu-ray now, and that covered one unit from their training to, I was an airborne unit from their training to landing in D-Day and all the way up through World War II. And that's certainly interesting, and I've noticed that a lot of people go there kind of to see the Band of Brothers sites because they've seen this movie. This uh, It was actually a Stephen Ambrose book as well originally, but then they've seen the HBO series and they want to see the sites where these things happened. So that one unit tends to attract uh, a lot of attention there. Um, so any of those would be would be great to watch. Um, none others come to mind immediately, but if, uh, if I think, yeah. Oh, there's probably others, yeah. Yeah, maybe if listeners, if you have uh, suggestions for other books or other movies, put put that in the comments below the show notes because I'm sure everybody yeah. knows about some great piece of art there, some great it, book that... Uh, and another, uh, there are also books about specific actions if you want to get, you know, a little more in depth. There was an amazing, um, a, a really heroic action by the British Airborne on the eastern area of the D-Day uh, landings where they crash landed a couple of these huge horse gliders crash landed them right at the foot of a bridge ran out and captured this bridge which was really something to to secure the eastern flank and there was a whole book about that called Pegasus Bridge um, so if you're interested more in the UK perspective that would be something something very interesting too excellent, excellent. all right one thing that you mentioned in your notes is the the name of yeah. the, the invasion yeah, well, I grew up in the States, and everybody always talked about the D-Day invasion. And I imagine if you're in England, they refer to it to the same, uh, with the same name. But when I got there, I found that the French inhabitants didn't use that term, and some of them found it peculiar because they didn't see the Allies as invaders but as liberators. Uh, you know, the, the Nazi Germany were the invaders. So I think maybe we think, well, we're invading, you know, German-occupied lands, but to the to the French inhabitants, we were the liberators. So they don't refer to it as D-Day invasion. And I try not to use that term, but it's it's become so historically embedded, it's hard to... Hard to yeah, it's hard not to, yeah. Yeah, in French, we refer to it... As yes, yes, I've seen that in several places. So so that's that's the... You know, it's it's a landing, and mm -hmm. the is a landing, so it's the Allied landing when people talk yes. about the, the debarquement. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's a term that has, I mean, for French people, we don't ever call it invasion. Yeah. You know, it's not. That, that's, you know, what the Allies did was not an invasion. Although, as you mentioned in your notes, yeah. lots of French people And, and lots, of, uh, lots of French people died, and mostly at the hands of the Allies. Not necessarily deliberately, but every time the Allies would go to try to take a town, you'd bomb it by the air, and you'd fire artillery there, and... A lot of towns were just completely flattened. And, you know, in the entire battle, it's hard to get statistics on deaths, but as best I can tell, in the entire Normandy uh, battle, which, again, goes all the way through Paris in September, 20,000 Normandy inhabitants died. And, and you know, that's a lot. And, and 3,000 Normandy people died within the first 24 hours of D-Day. And to put that in perspective, that's more than the American deaths of that battle. So more of the French died 
that day than Americans did. Yet when you go there, you will see, you know, French flags and uh, British flags and American flags flying side by side, Canadian flags sometimes. And it's not just, you know, a restaurant that's trying to attract, you know, the American tourists for their business, but it'll be in people's front yards and on little kids' bicycles. I mean, they truly, truly are appreciative for uh, the sacrifices that were made back then. And where I've gone on several, you know, uh, anniversaries of D-Day, there's several, although fewer and fewer each time, but several vets that show up, and the the inhabitants there just adore them and are really appreciative. And you, you see it literally bring citizens, uh, you know, tears to their eyes, um, and and even people from other countries as well. It's just it's very moving, but they they are definitely full of appreciation. And the old stereotype that we hear in the states about how all well, the French are rude or they don't like Americans, you don't sense that one bit in Normandy. No, no, I don't think you sense that at all. And, and you know, it's, I mean, French people, we, we still mm -hmm. learn history in school, and um, they spend, uh, kids spend a lot yep. of time on World War II history. Not specifically on D-Day, you know, necessarily, but they, they know that without D-Day... Very different world. <laughs> you know, yeah, the world will be a very different place, and so... There's a lot of appreciation for that. And the, and the other thing that's starting to happen more and more now is to try and see the German, how the Germans got yes. roped into this. Uh, yes, and yes. And, and there were a lot of German deaths as well. And they weren't all, you know, Nazi fanatics. They were just people that, that was their job to go to, to, go to war. And, and I think, you know, if you have a longer than a couple days um, in Normandy, it's really important not just to visit the American or even the Allied cemeteries, but go visit a German cemetery because, you know, everyone's heard of the uh, Normandy American Cemetery above Omaha Beach, and they're just shy of 10,000 uh, soldiers buried there. Well, right up the road, there's one of several German cemeteries where there's 20,000 Germans buried. Um, so they, I mean, yes, Germany started the war, but they paid the price as well uh, at the normal German German people did. And the same thing with, you know, towns being bombed and things like that. So, um, yeah. Yeah. very much, very much so. All right. So we, let's go back to your, you giving advice to your friends. The first thing you, we, you said is decide if you're going to, yep. you're going to book a tour, and we, read some books. Yeah. And then I would, I would start picking some, some places that you want to see. Um, and if you have time, leave time for extras, but definitely decide, uh, based on how much time you have, what sites are important to you. I think for a lot of American uh, visitors, first-time visitors, they definitely want to see Omaha Beach. They would definitely want to see the American Cemetery above it. Um, but as you learn the history of it, there's a lot of other pretty major battle sites. Um, and you might have, I, would, I would list those out because you're not going to get between them and five minutes, you know, apart, you definitely want to plan out your trip, say on this morning, we'll go to the, you know, cemetery and this afternoon, go to this beach or something like that. Um, and try to, you know, push your envelope a little bit too. like, try to see something you don't know a lot about, uh, you know, maybe visit, you know, there's this wonderful little Canadian cemetery that's, um, just, it's pretty close to Bayou and, um, you know, see some things that maybe from the other perspective or the German cemetery or things like that. But make a list of things that, yeah. you know, that you want to get to and, and try to plan it out. Of course, this gets back to whether, you know, uh, tourists are real planners or just kind of want to play it by ear. Um, I'm, I, as, you, as, as you figured out, I'm a real planner. I like to have these things mapped out. But it's nice to have a little bit of flexibility, too. It's all these sites or most of these sites are outdoors. Um, and there, you definitely get rainy days in Normandy, which I – Got a lot of on this trip. I had been lucky up until this trip. <laughs> so maybe yeah, this so maybe you change your plans. And on this day, we're going to go see museums because we can stay dry inside. And the next thing I think you'd want to do is, is figure out yeah. where you want to stay, where, where your base of operations would be. That's what I was going. That's what I was going to ask you next. Is did you stay in one? Um, place I or did you I usually place? stay in one place. This time I, I stayed in two places. I, I my first night I spent the night in a hotel that literally overlooked Omaha Beach. It was a Hotel du Casino, and it's the only one I know of that's like this. It, it literally looks right out over the beach, and I had eaten there before because I have a restaurant, and I thought, well, let me just wake up on that beach that morning. And then because I'm so interested in the airborne operations and the American operations, I always go all the way out to the west area to a town called St. Mary Glees, 
which was really the epicenter of the airborne operations and was the first town liberated on D-Day. And it was liberated by American parrot. And to me, it's, it's a great town. It's a festive town. Um, and it, it just fits my travel style and my interest. But it is a small... Well, at the, on the anniversary of D-Day, um, they, they celebrate the anniversary. They celebrate the American paratrooper. There are, um, there are very somber ceremonies, but there are also uh, military people partying in the streets, etc. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real fun town. But it is a small town. There's only a, a few restaurants. Um, it's fairly rural. Uh, there aren't a lot of shops or anything like that. And that may not suit everybody. I, I think for a lot of people, a nice town to base out of would be Bayou. And that is, it's a beautiful town in and of its own. And it's fairly central between the American and the British beaches. Uh, and it's a good sized town, too. And unlike most good sized towns in that area, it wasn't destroyed in the Battle of Normandy. I don't understand exactly, but it's fairly well preserved. There's a lot of half-timbered medieval buildings, a lot of restaurants. Um, it, it's a great place to stay if, if you're not really into staying back somewhere too rural. And it's fairly central. Right, right. Yeah, Caen is also a nice city. Yeah, yeah it was, it was leveled pretty much. Uh, yeah, uh, but it, it's, it's yeah. self-centered. So, yeah, Bayou is a Yeah, I agree. I agree. I've never actually stayed in Caen. I have gone a couple times where I've taken a train either to Caen or out of Caen. And that works very well if you don't want to drive. If you're driving but you don't want to, you know, deal with Paris traffic or spending a couple hours getting there in a car. There is a, a train station in Caen and a, a couple rental car agencies right outside of there. So it's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. I, and I, But, you know, my understanding is it was it was completely flattened during the war and there's very little remaining there. Yeah, yeah. So 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 the way you could do that is you'd fly into Paris, maybe yep. spend the first night in Paris yep. you're going to be thrashed. And then the next day you yep. get a train to Caen. And yeah, I think that would work well for a lot of travelers. The only reason I didn't take a train there this time is I find it, and maybe you can help me with this, but... Uh, the train that serves Normandy runs out of uh, the, the Saint-Lazare train station, and I find it hard to get from the Paris airport to there. It seems like you have to take one train into the city, then the RER over to Saint-Lazare, and I just felt like I'd be wasting a lot of time getting from one end of Paris to the other, whereas if I picked up a car in Paris, I could be immediately hitting the road and, and, and going on my way. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. I've never been to Saint Lazare, so I can't really, off the top of my head, I can't give any advice. But, but, but yeah, if you're comfortable driving, you know, landing in Paris, because you're probably going to land somewhere yep. around. Yeah, most of the flights are around. 10 PM, yeah. 10, and of course, if you're combining. Uh, yeah, and if you're combining this with a larger trip that maybe includes several days in Paris, then that would be great. Spend some days in Paris, see it, and then however you want, work your way over to the train station. Uh, And driving out of Paris is not such a huge deal. You know, parking yeah. in Paris is a problem. Yeah. But if you don't have to park, then <clears throat> just grab a rental yeah. car and drive off. And uh, if you can, you know, if you can drive in a big city in America. Yes, yes, I agree. And and you don't really, for going from the airport, you don't really have to be in the heart of the city. You can really take outer ring roads. Although no. I ended up arriving around 8 o'clock, which is right around rush hour. And there was a lot of rain, and there was talks of a train strike. So it took me forever to get out of Paris. But I just thought, well, maybe. Every day in Paris. <laughs> but once I was, you know, once I was outside of the ring roads and heading towards Normandy, it was still raining, but there was no traffic. And at least I know I'm, you know, I'm heading towards my destination at, at yeah. this point. Uh, right. So when you, when you, once you are in Bayeux and you mm -hmm. settled into your hotel, How long does it take you? At, what's the longest you have to drive? Well, if you were going to go to the, the westernmost sites, which is Utah Beach and St. Maraglis, um, that would be a good 45 minutes probably from Bayou. Um, and because there's a, there's a big gap. If you look at a map of the D-Day area, there's a pretty big gap between Utah Beach and Omaha Beach. Utah, originally there were only four beaches, and Utah Beach was added late in the planning stage to secure that western flank and eventually so that the allies could 
drive up towards Cherbourg and take the whole Cotentin Peninsula. Um, so that was added later on, and there's a, a big estuary in between those two beaches. So it's a little bit of a drive between Omaha and Utah Beach or between Bayou and, and Utah Beach. Um, but everything else is within a half hour of Bayou. It really is. Uh, all the beach, there's one major road, you know, highway that goes from Kong all the way through the area and up to Cherbourg, which is N13. Uh, but all the beach areas are in, are, you know, N13 is inland from all the beach areas by, you know, maybe several miles. So you do need. Right. And then you get off and you go into a, onto a D, a departmental drive. Uh, yes. That will take you. Yeah, and I find that <laughs> that's a little bit different for American drivers at any rate. Is when you take it's it's very narrow, and they're usually or a lot of the roads are only basically one lane wide, but they're two lane roads. So everybody barrels down the road until a car comes the other direction, and then you slow down quick. Somebody gets in the grass. Hopefully, it doesn't get in the ditch. And then as soon as you patch, you pass the person. You're barreling down the road again, <laughs> and it's it's kind of. Um, <laughs> It's definitely heads up driving because these little towns, and there can be tiny little town, a town maybe just a couple houses and a, a farmyard with a barn. Um, and you slow down in the town, but then as soon as you get out of the town, people, I think the speed limit goes back up to 90, which is about 55 miles an hour. Yeah, so, um, and people get right back up the speed on a one lane road. And so it's a little, you're not used to that. You're going to have somebody in, in a, in your rear view mirror that that is used to that and wants you to get moving um so it's not for, it's not for all drivers i don't think but i i grew up driving in new england and we're kind of known for our our aggressiveness and i i use that in a good way i i, I like the french drivers because they pay attention when the light turns green they go they're not you know they don't in general seem to be distracted they pay attention to their driving and you need to pay attention when you're driving there for sure yeah, yeah, yeah. So be mindful that there are often ditches, and sometimes the grass is, uh, is has grown tall. Yes. You can't really see the ditch. So if you're going to be pulling off of the road, you might have a foot or so of space, but that's it. Yeah, you're not going to give the other car five feet in between you to pass, or you in the. And no, once no, or twice, I have had to. You're, you're I've had to back up. You know, I came across a. A big. Yeah. It might have been a, a tour group in kind of a larger van, and oh, you know. Yeah, but I just passed a farm with a little entrance to a field on the side, so I knew if I backed up, he could get by. So occasionally you have to do that. Um, right. And the and the rule is the smaller vehicle. Oh, is that right? That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's the rule. <laughs> so yeah, be prepared to do that. But I mean, it's not. It's, no, it is. It's really not that bad. Even in the middle of the summer, you you have. You know, a few cars an hour, but... Yeah, yeah, and that's true. And, and I was there during the anniversary of, of D-Day, and there was a lot of tourists there for that. But when you're driving in between the towns, you really don't sense that there's a lot of people around. It's, it, you're often the only car going down the road for quite some time. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So, hmm. um, one last piece of advice for potential travelers. <laughs> if you are with children... Or elderly persons? Do you have any tips for those people? Well, um, let me think about that. That's a good question. I'll say one thing. Uh, if you're with elderly people that might have some mobility issues, uh, a lot of the places you might stay are, you know, all the, all the rooms are going to be on upper floors. And one thing to be careful of, too, if, if you forget, coming from the U.S., we refer to the first floor above the ground floor as the second floor. Correct, yes. So a first floor room means you have to climb a flight of stairs yes. and people may not be used to that. And some, like I stayed in a little B and B in San Maraglis and it was a tiny staircase. So you'd want to ask about that. I think yeah. before, before you book a place, um, if you have mobility issues, definitely be very specific. We, we had a, an episode a few episodes ago about that with a person who's quadriplegic, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And she, her advice was be very specific to what you need. And yep. Send the hotel an email and say, I need this, this, and this. Do you have that? Yes. You know? and, yeah. And, and when you're specific, keep in mind what the term first floor means to the French. Yes. First floor <laughs> is one flight of stairs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as far as kids, I don't know. I've never traveled there with kids. Um, I would think that a lot of the sites to see are 
uh, uh, they're very sobering. And if you're very young, you may not even understand it. So I would think you'd want to maybe break it up with, you know, not doing two straight days of historical sites. I think a lot of kids would go crazy with that. Um, I tend to go in early June, but I'm sure later in the summer, I mean, it's all beaches all around there. So there's a lot of uh, uh, beach activities, although it's cold water, but um, there are beach activities. I was parked on Omaha Beach one morning on this recent trip, and all of a sudden some horses with carts came galloping down the beach. And I know there was some horse riding um, around Omaha Beach and around Utah Beach uh, and things like that. Yeah. yeah, there's all kinds of activities for kids, but you have to look, up, look those up in advance. You know? Yeah, and they're probably not going to be, you know, the heavy World War II sites. Um, right. you know. I, I- I was there with my daughter when she was fairly young. She was probably maybe, I don't know, 10 or something. Mm-hmm. And she did great in the bigger museums yep. that had things specifically for children. Yes. Uh, she did great on the beaches also because she could just blow us off and start building a sandcastle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, so it was, those were good. But it's true that if you're going to go from one small monument to another small monument to another you know that would get old for kids I think. yeah there are a lot of um there are a lot of like old gun encasements and you know uh, hitler's atlantic wall where he poured yeah. tons of concrete into gun emplacements and some are museums that you pay to enter but some are just you walk down the beach and you find these things and if you know, if kids are aware of just, you know, don't jump into a hole that's too deep or something like that, you know, that could be a fun thing for them to explore. I guess right. it depends on the age of the kid. Yeah, and it'd be, and it's fine. You can climb around and you can play and you can do whatever you want in a real bunker. I mean, that's yes. what those are, you know. Yeah, and, and some of them, the one of the uh, amazing sites that I didn't see on this trip just because I've been there so many times. Oops, I lost you there. Old Beach, and it's this beautiful field with farms all around. Just a sec, just a sec. I lost you there for a second. I, I okay. Not, not the, so you were talking about a beach that you went to, a story about kids. Oh, yeah. There's a big uh, gun emplacement uh, called Long Sumer. I, I'm probably getting that pronunciation wrong, but it's between Omaha Beach and Gold Beach, and there are these four very large gun emplacements, and the guns are still in them. They're, they don't function, of course, but it's one of the few where they left the guns there, and you can you know clamber around. Uh, closer to the coast, there's an observation area where spotters could see where the shells were landing and, and you know, uh, make adjustments to the guns. And I'm sure kids would would love that, and it's enough walking around between the, the different emplacements that burn off some energy, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, now, can you tell us about some of your favorite sites and places that people should not miss that, to you, are most meaningful? Oh, I lost you again. Oh. Oh, no, now I can hear you. Okay. You're back. All right. okay, you, I, I lost you right when you said, can you tell me about some of your... Your, your favorite sites that you think maybe are not as well known, because obviously everybody knows about Omaha Beach and the cemetery above Omaha Beach, which is yeah. a definite must-go see that. Yeah. I would say St. Maraglis. Again, it's a town that kind of celebrates the paratrooper. There is an airborne museum there. Um, that they Every time I go, there's some new uh, exhibit um, but they've got, you know, aircraft and gliders, and um, so so that's kind of my favorite area that a lot of people might not get to, particularly if they've only got a day or two. Like I say, they might just not get to the western western area. Yeah. It, it, I don't know if it's a regular occurrence with your international Skype calls or. Yeah, or not. it happens. It happens. It's. I think on this in this instance, it was my internet connection that was yeah. uh, a little bit spotty. I live in a village, you know. I gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right. So you were talking about uh, Point the Hawk, I think you call it. How do you Point to Hawk. Yeah. Uh, P O I N T E D U H O C. Oh, yeah, point you. Okay, okay. all right. Very yeah. good. Very good. Uh, and it was a site of a, um, a really major battle. Um, and uh, it's really phenomenal to think that they were even able to pull it off. Basically, this is a huge cliff above the ocean with no beach below it. And this group of American Army Rangers brought their landing craft to the base of the cliff and using grappling hooks that they fired with rockets and ropes and ladders, they scaled this cliff. 
um, to get at the German gun emplacement on top of it. And all this while, of course, the Germans are lobbing hand grenades down on them and shooting down at them. And just the fact that they could scale this cliff with without anybody attacking them would be phenomenal. Wow. Um, but they they feared that these guns that were situated up there could fire upon the whole uh, landing beach area, and they really thought it was important to to take them out. Mm-hmm. So prior to the night before D-Day, they they bombed this severely uh, with the Air Force. And when you go to this site, it's it's really it's almost like a moonscape because there are so many craters from the bombs that landed there. Mm. And to imagine that people came up this very high cliff using ropes with people shooting at them and somehow got to the top. That's and incredible. After this area is incredible. It, it truly is. So is there anything left of the ropes and the hooks and all that? Not the ropes and the hooks, but there are there were a lot of, again, concrete bunkers, and several of them are smashed in, but several of them you can climb down in. Um, there's a very uh, famous monument there to these rangers uh, that I don't believe you can still get to, and it's in danger of or or has already fallen into the sea. Uh, but this was the monument where, on the 40th anniversary of D-Day, President Reagan gave a speech referring to the boys of Point de Hoc um, and their heroism. And I think that... That 40th anniversary and Reagan's visit there really did a lot to bring attention to revisiting this whole area in mm-hmm. uh, general. So I, I think for me, if I, a friend was asking what sites do I have to see, I would add that to the list, the Point du Hoc. Okay. Um, just, just phenomenal. Okay. Um, the the Long Summer, which is the gun battery that I mentioned earlier that might be good for kids. Um, is, and how is do a, you spell that? Uh, L O U N G U E S. Okay. All right. Think Sumer, uh, by the sea. Um, Sumer, yes, yeah, sur Sumer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I I'm didn't looking... ask you, do you speak any French? Uh, pas très bien. Pas très bien. Okay. One year of French. I work at a, for a university, and uh-huh. I took one year of French at the school, kind of in preparation for this, and I'm, I'm trying. Yeah. But I'll be going back there, so I have to keep. <laughs> Keep working at it, <laughs> but but uh, but you you managed just fine with the natives. Yeah, I did. I mean, I, I really tried to use as much French as I could, even when they instantly switched to English, um, <laughs> just because I forgot I won't learn if they just speak English. But there were some people that I met, and s- some French tourists that were there, and some restaurants I went to where they truly didn't either didn't speak English or my one year of French was better than their. English, so we had to get by in French, but it was a pretty stilted conversation. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty quick. It's over the yeah. past ones. Okay, so... But, but I, and I do think, I, I really admire a lot of the tidbits you've given in your show about, you know, you know, trying to adopt the culture, say bonjour everywhere. Yeah. Um, it, it does make a difference uh, in, in how you're treated and, and how people... You don't want someone's first reaction to you to be negative, so, you know... Right. Try to adopt the local customs and fit in yeah. as best you can. Yeah, so, that is, it's the magic sauce here. Bonjour yeah. fixes everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. So, um, all right. So, uh, Point de Hoc, uh, obviously Omaha Beach and the cemetery above yeah. it um, is very, very sobering, um, yeah. but very moving. But it's also interesting to see, like you'll see f- uh, French school kids taking field trips there. Uh, and that's that's really nice to see. And you, you'll see, you know, people visiting, you know, the the stone to a person that they know. Um, yes. And and then you'll, there's a lot of military people there just, you know, just looking around. Um, it, it's I, I was fortunate on one of my earlier trips to gain access to that cemetery before they were open at sunrise, uh, mm. I was doing some professional photography, and it was one of the more humbling and sobering places I've ever visited. Yeah. Um, and I, I've tried to do that a few times since. Unfortunately, the sun doesn't always rise in Normandy, and it, it didn't on any of my, uh, my days there this, this time. What do you mean but, the sun doesn't rise? It rises. <laughs> well, it rises, but it's above a bunch of clouds and rain. That you you don't see it. see it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, uh, some other things to see, the uh, town of, uh, of Aromanches. Yes, Ar- Aromanches, is a, yeah. Aromanches is a British beach. And what one thing the Allies did, which some of these things were just phenomenal. If you don't know the history, you start learning it, you think, what, they really did that? They needed a harbor, and there were no harbors in this area. So they basically prefabricated a harbor 
and towed it across the English Channel. Wow. And they did two. I believe one at Omaha Beach and one in Hermanche. And they they sunk these old ships out as a breakwater, and they had these these floating roadways they'd get from big ships uh, at anchor onto the beach because they had to supply so much men and material after the initial D Day. They mm-hmm. had to just keep pouring in, you know, food and gasoline and ammunition, and everything. So they built these artificial harbors, and ironically, just a couple weeks later, the worst storm in over a hundred years wow. hit the English Channel and destroyed them. Oh. Uh, and they weren't they weren't fully rebuilt after that, but some of the wreckage of the harbor can be seen in Aromanche. Mm. The, the old breakwaters are out there in the distance. These some of these floating pieces, which are huge, they're you know larger than a big truck, are just sitting on the beach. So you can really see the remnants of that. And there's actually a wonderful little museum right there about this floating harbor. And they have a a movie and a little model of the harbor. Because uh, you picture that there's a big ship out at anchor, and there's these floating roadways with trucks going back and forth. It's just, it's I just mean, fantastic. Th- to imagine. Ima- I can't imagine uh, trucks going over a floating roadway. Like yeah. that blows my mind. I know, <laughs> mine too. That blows yeah, they my did. Mind. And, they, and you see some, like some of the, uh, some of the museums have made displays of this sort of thing. And so you yes. can actually see that in museums. Yes, and actually some of these floating roadways, some sections of it, there's a road that leads down to Omaha Beach on the west end of Omaha Beach, and they have several segments of this just off the road. Um, it's behind a fence, but you, you get an idea of the scale of it. Wow. Uh, and That's cool. Yeah, I mean, there was so much – I mean, the Germans did so much to reinforce the entire Atlantic coast, and the Allies had to come up with so many – so much material and so many plans to defeat that Atlantic wall. Mm-hmm. That there was just so much stuff built and delivered there that, you know, it doesn't all disappear. So, so you see the concrete from the German reinforcements, you see the remnants of these floating docks. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even though it's a very peaceful area, peaceful beach now, you, it's, you can't really forget that something yeah. major happened there less than a hundred years ago. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. What are some of your favorite museums around there? Well, uh, my favorite museum is the one at Utah Beach. And and that, like a lot of good museums, tends to get better every time I I go there. They Mm. keep adding to the exhibits. And that's right on Utah Beach. It's actually built into one of the concrete um, fortresses that were right along that stretch of of the ocean. Mm -hmm. And Utah Beach, unlike all the other beaches, hasn't been built up. There are no houses right around there. There's no shops. There's no restaurants. It's still very rural uh, for several miles inland. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think it gives you a feel for what that beach must have been like then. But the museum itself and the exhibits are very comprehensive. Uh, There's another wonderful museum in Bayou that gives a good overview Mm -hmm. of of the battle. Um, I highly recommend that one. I didn't go to that one on this trip because I've been twice before. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Airborne Museum in St. Maraglis gives a good overview of the American airborne operations. Right. And then there's a museum on the eastern end for um, Pegasus Bridge, the the bridge over the either river or canal that the mm-hmm. British landed by glider and stormed. That's a great museum as well. Mm-hmm. Now, this year, there's a new museum well, new. It's, it's new since I was there last. And it's just inland from Omaha Beach called Overlord Museum. Mm. And it was really interesting. And here, I guess going back to things that kids might like, it doesn't give as much of an overview of the battles and things. But what it has is an amazing collection of vehicles, mm. tanks, trucks, uh, motorcycles. There's even, you know, a lot of the German military was still moving by horse in World War II. So they have you know, these horse carriages that were regular, you know, military uh, pieces. Right. And it's a relatively new museum. I believe that there was a person that collected, a French person that grew up in that area, had a logging business. He collected these and started restoring them, but they didn't really have a home. And um, he recently died, I think, before the museum even opened. Um, but I had never been in the museum before, and I thought it was it was fantastic. Oh, uh, cool. And again, I think kids would really appreciate that, you know, Big big tanks and tracked vehicles and the like. Right, it's the, stuff you can put your hands on, and it's yeah. more real. Yeah, 
Um, I also, for the first time on this trip, went to a Juno Center, which is on Juno Beach, which is the Canadian sector, and it's a museum and visitor center, I believe, run by the Canadian government, and that was very interesting. I would uh, I just had never s- spent much time there or seen that. Um, hmm. yeah. So most of these museums are run by French people, except, yeah. I mean, obviously, the, the cemetery... The Omaha Beach Cemetery is an, it's American. It's American. It's American land, and yeah. it's run by the American Battle Monument Commission. Right. Uh, most of the museums, I believe, are run by French people, but there are a lot of associations too oh, yeah. that do a lot of uh, do a lot of work to preserve the history and to honor the people that were there before. Um, and in, in fact, if you go on the anniversary of D Day, uh, there are a lot more options because. You know, I've gone on a couple of walking tours of particular airborne operations where you get access to these farmers' fields that you can't normally just walk on and see, you know, actual foxholes where battles took place. Mm-hmm. And that was run by, uh, I forget what it's called, Association Normandy. It's some French association out in the western part of uh, the D-Day area. Mm. And they give these tours, and y- usually – there's enough people that speak English that they have, they break into groups and one group is led with an English speaker. Mm. Uh, And so that can be very interesting and can, you can cover a lot of ground there. Right. Yeah. For special Uh, events, they probably open some things that are not open all the time. Yes. Yes. And there's also another thing, which I think is great, which is on the actual anniversary of D-Day or the closest weekend day to that, they have a huge, military operation where they drop a lot of paratroopers uh, into an area near St. Miraglis called La Fierre. And the La Fierre Causeway was a, a brutal two-day battle to kind of secure the western flank of uh, of the, the battle area. So and La Fierre, I'm going to ask you to spell that again. L-A, yeah. like the proud? F- Excuse me, L-A-F-I-E... With a accent, I forget whether it's accent grave or yeah. what. Yeah. Uh, R E. Right. So that means the proud, la fierre. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that area was there was a bridge over the the Merret River, and what the Germans had done is they had flooded the rivers. They had u- controlled the locks to flood all the areas there to make it much more difficult for airborne uh, or glider uh, operations to land in these mm-hmm. huge fields next to the river. So there's this one bridge that they really needed to capture to secure their flank. And, of course, the Germans needed to capture it to be able to come attack the Americans uh, closer to the ocean. So there's a huge battle that raged there for two days. And because there, because of the history of the airborne operation there and because there's a big landing area, uh, the U.S. as well as other countries' militaries bring their airborne in and kind of to, to celebrate the anniversary, they drop – just tons and tons of paratroopers on wow. this field. And you, you can you have to get there early and park a little ways away, but you can stand right by the road and watch the planes going overhead and, and dropping the, the paratroopers. And, <laughs> and that's a lot of fun. And the paratroopers themselves are staying in or around the towns. So, right, you know, you sure. see them on the streets and uh, seeing them greeting some World War II vets is a very moving, very that's moving really experience. nice. Yeah. And then just... Just randomly throughout the day, you may be in downtown St. Mary's and these huge transport planes will just buzz the town because they're there and that's what they do. <laughs> uh, so there's all these aircraft going overhead. A couple of years ago, I saw some French um, fighter jet like a uh, uh, like demonstration force, almost like the American Thunderbirds or something. Oh, yeah. Uh, and they were just flying off the coast. I think they were warming me up for an air show, but I'm right on the coast just watching them. <laughs> right, great. right. So that's called La Patrouille de France. La Patrouille de France. Yes, yes. They hey. they do exhibitions all over, and it's a special group of uh, crazy flyers. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't even sure they were French, but then all of a sudden they, they started smoke coming out of the back of the planes, yeah. and it was red, white, and blue. I'm like, well, that must be French. Yeah, yeah, that's La Patrouille de France. They're, that's their signature. They always do something like that. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and and by now the Fren- French army also has a military – uh, transport plane, the yes. A400M. I don't know yes. if it's ever flown in, in, there or not. Uh, I know there were 
I saw six transport planes there. Four I know were U.S. military, and I don't know what the other two were. Mm. Um, the four American ones were C-130s. I, the other right. two were comparable size, but I don't really know the model. I, I assume at least one of them was French. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But you do. I mean, if they didn't fly one there, they'd be crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and you do see military, not just American military, but you see military – you know, on the anniversary from all countries involved, including Germany. Yeah. Uh, and I was in a very moving ceremony on the morning of the 6th, and I didn't understand most of what was said because it was said in French, uh, but there was a French military unit there, an American airborne unit there, and a German military unit there, all standing at attention, all saluting. Um, and several years ago, I went to a ceremony at a memorial um, I forget the name of the town, but there were several military units there, and the German military band played the American national anthem, and I thought that was very touching and something. Yes, you, you sent me a picture of that. That that was yeah. like wow. It's not something you would expect to see, but it's you know I mean we're all allies now, and it, it was an awful awful history, but um, right. but we're not still at war, and and, Thank uh, and 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 the German soldiers are there to you know to show respect and. Uh, so yeah. it's it's moving. Yeah, yeah. overall, we've I, I think it's moving more and more in that direction, and it's trickling yes. down to the young people. You know, young French people who go to school. That's the message they get: is you know, this is a long time ago. We don't want to forget, but but those aren't the same people. <laughs> yeah, th those aren't the same people, and we have to build Europe. And you know, that's yeah. one of the f very first pillars of European unity. The one of the, the biggest reason why it was put together is so that there would not be any more world wars on European mm -hmm. soil or any, well, anywhere if we can help it. But, you know, yeah, that was a massive goal. And so far it's worked. Well, you know, I mean, yes. Yeah. I mean, Europe's been relatively peaceful for the past many years. Yeah. <laughs> we hope we yeah. keep it that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you, I mean, Kosovo was bad, but yeah. All right. Uh, okay. I think we've covered a lot of ground. Is there anything else that I, didn't ask you about i'm looking through your um so so let's talk a little bit about the feeling of the area normandy as like a, yes. as a tourist destination what did you think of yeah and and i i guess you know well let me think about this what i'm trying to think what appeals to me about it and what may appeal to other people one is the rural nature of it i mean i I love visiting Paris. I love visiting big cities occasionally, but I'm more of a country type person mm -hmm. and I like seeing the, the pastoral farms and, and, you know, I, I got a little schedule ahead of time of each town when they had their farmer's market. It's always fun to visit those farmer's markets because sure. it's a real, it's a real staple of how those towns operate. And it's not a tourism thing. It's just, uh, no, that's it's how, just how people, yeah. yeah so you get a feel live. for <laughs> Yes. Um, so, you know, all, all these little towns having their, their farmer's markets, um, there's, it's a huge farming area. There's a lot of, uh, of produce there, primarily dairy products and apple. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, tasting some of that cuisine is really important. Go to a Calvados cellar and, and taste and maybe bring back some Calvados, which I did on this trip. Yeah, Calvados, uh, it's, uh, we should explain. Calvados is a, uh, it's a strong alcohol. It's, it's almost yeah. like the French version of a type of whiskey, but it's not whiskey. It's, it's made out of apple and it's really, yep. really strong. It's like, it'll, it is really strong. It's, yeah. It's, 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 <laughs> The one downside of Normandy to me is one thing that a lot of people like about France is French wine, and there is no wine production in Normandy. Not that I can no. tell. I just don't think it's the right climate. And you can certainly buy good French wine in the grocery store, uh, but you're not going to go tasting wine in Normandy. No, <laughs> so no. Calvados is the next best thing, I guess. Actually, it's the soil that's the problem because if you if is that you right? yeah, uh, Bordeaux is very similar, but uh, Normandy has this loamy kind of soil. Yes. And, and um, to do grapes, you you need uh, uh, de l'argile. I don't know how to say that in English. Um, anyway, it's it's a different type of soil. You need very more lime, it drains better, things like that. Yeah, 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 probably. And it's not rich soil. It's a poor, you know, you need a poor soil mm -hmm. to, to grow yep. uh, grapes properly. So that's, that's, I think that's the biggest reason why, like around Paris and West, that whole area has very little wine, if any at all. 
Yeah. But they have a lot of uh, cider and, um, you know, s sweet cider, le, le, le cidre doux. That's what you give mm -hmm. children. And then you have le, le vrai cidre. And that one is... Uh, the hard has, cider? Yeah, hard cider. That one's going to have maybe 3% alcohol. I mean, it's low alcohol, but... Um, yeah. Yeah. And then the Calvados is... Very probably tiny. half that's, alcohol. <laughs> yeah, that's probably 30 plus percent alcohol. It's not, you know, and it's not it's, very sweet. No, it's definitely just something for, for sipping. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that if you're going to visit the area and you want to see you a little bit of the some. culture, yeah. you should try some for yeah. sure. And the uh, food is very good. I mean, we make fun of them, you know, you know, would you like a little cream with your butter is kind of the question. At the... <laughs> On top of your cheese. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's delicious. It's, it's really, really good. Yeah, and the yeah, crêpe, really. of course, crêperie, that's, mm -hmm. that's the area. I mean, the crêpes are from uh, Brittany, but I mean, Normandy is close enough. Close enough, yeah. Right. You, you have great bread. You have, you yeah. know, a lot of great... And, and, I, and I think that even though the one thing that will get a lot of people to that area is the World War II sites, and I think that's important, I think it's also important to step out and see some of these other things, not just the food and culture, but I always try to pick something there that isn't related to World War II, and I'm going to do this. So a few years ago, I went to um, Mont Saint-Michel, um, and I was going to, on this trip, go to Enfleur, which I've never been to before. Mm -hmm. But leaving leaving Paris, it was raining all day and heavily overcast, and my idea of sitting out at an outdoor cafe looking at the boats didn't sound so appealing if I was going to get right. wet. <laughs> so, so I didn't do that this time, but I did do something which I've never done on previous trips, which is visited the, the Bayou Tapestry. Oh. And... That's a very interesting for people that don't know. I think you did a show about it, but it was another uh, invasion across the English Channel, but this time going in the opposite direction Correct. from Normandy to England, yeah. and it was in the year 1066. Right. So the tapestry itself was basically a bit of uh, propaganda or something celebrating yeah. this victory that was done just within a few years of the battle, and it's amazing that this thousand-year-old piece of cloth – yeah. is still around and still in pretty good shape. And yeah, uh, so I'd always known about it. And because it was a rainy trip and I had to find more museums and less outdoor things to do, I thought that was a great thing to, yeah, yeah. to visit. And it's very fun. You you pay a few euros to get in and then you get yeah. into this. It's a moving sidewalk, isn't it? No, but it, you, no, okay. there's an audio guide that keeps you moving because okay. the different it, it's about 70 meters long. Right. And it, it kind of goes around a corner. So if you're following the audio, you have to keep moving. And I think that's kind of how they keep the pace going and keep there from being bottlenecks. And it worked well. You weren't trying to peer over anybody's shoulder to see anything. Right. Um, and you really need to take the audio guide. Otherwise, you'll just... You keep, wouldn't understand. Yeah. You'll see stuff and you'll be like, what the... You know. Yeah. yeah I mean... But there was... If you were... Uh, the, thing was they apparently during this battle or during this time of during that year was one of the passes of Haley's Comet. And so they yes. actually em embroidered Haley's Comet into this tapestry because yes. that happened back then in 1066. And I thought, wow, that's a little yes. bit of history right there. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, it's it's lovely. And if you have any interest in uh, weaving and cloth and yeah, th historical textiles. things like that, yeah. It's yeah. it's very fun to see. It's one thing for a piece of granite to be around a thousand years later, but for a piece of cloth to be around, colored cloth no less, is, yeah. is really fun. And then there's also the, the Bayou Cathedral, which is this huge cathedral yeah. that uh, is another nice thing to visit there that's not, you know, not battle related. And uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so, you know, uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of people will get there and as part of a larger trip, they'll say, well, I'll take a day or maybe two days in Normandy and you won't have time for these things. But I would just encourage people to stretch your schedule a little and try to spend an extra day or two out there and see as many D-Day sites as you can, but also see some of those other things out there that yeah. truly just make them wonderful. Yeah. And I wanted to mention the museum. The, there's a museum at Caen that I thought yes. was really interesting. I don't remember the name of it. Now I'll, I'll look it up and put it in the show notes, but I, I thought that one was very well done, especially for kids. I thought they had a lot of good stuff. Yeah, I've not been to that one, and I'm, I've just never spent any time in that city. Mm -hmm. um, and at reading reviews of museums, I always picked other ones to go to. But I've, right. I've heard I've heard some good things said about it, and I do think it's got maybe a few more things uh, geared towards kids as, yeah. as well. There are um, so many museums. It's, it's crazy. And yes. you, have, you have a lot of really tiny private museums, too, which yes. can be interesting, especially if you speak the language. You know, you pay yeah, a couple of euros I, and you go in there and it's it's a one-room museum pretty much of mm -hmm. a collector, somebody who's 
gone around collecting items. And spend their life as keeping these things and preserving them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I also went to a, a farm museum in St. Marigliese a few years ago. Uh, it was basically kind of the history of the farming in the region. So a lot of you know farming techniques from a couple hundred years ago. And I, I found that, that very interesting. They had these old structures and, and, and old barns and old farm implements. And again, it, it you know gets you out of your... yeah out of your comfort zone or something you already know everything about and, right. and see something new. So, right. And did, yeah. so did you do some skydiving this last time? I, I did for the first time in on my trip there. I, I've done a lot of skydiving in the U.S. Right. Uh, and every time I go there, I watch the military jump, and I've always thought, you know, I need to get out of a plane over Normandy. It's been such an important <laughs> part of my life. So I couldn't get on with the military. Uh, but oh, well, there's yeah. a couple reenactment groups that jump there, and there's one RCPT, which is a round canopy parachute team, um, that I found online, and I got in touch with uh, the people that run it, and they're all people. It's not first time skydivers. Uh, right. These guys have all jumped several times at least before, but it's jumping using the old style equipment with round parachutes and um, old harnesses, which actually scared me a little bit compared to the more modern stuff. <laughs> but they. They jumped out of uh, two C-47s, which was the transport plane that was used on D-Day. Mm. And we took off from the same airport as the military uh, and jumped into that same Lafayette Causeway. Um, wow. And it's just something that I've always wanted to do and, and hope to do again. But it was it was phenomenal being in that plane. It was this amazing jumping in that area. Mm -hmm. And then shortly after I landed, I, I gathered up my gear and I'm walking off the landing zone. And there was this World War II vet, an airborne vet, who I had just met like the night before or two nights before in downtown St. Mary Glees. Mm. And he was kind of in the VIP area and uh, got, greeting me as I came off. And uh, and it was great. It was just a, a wonderful experience. It was almost all European jumpers. There's one other American that I know of. Mm -hmm. uh, but European jumpers wearing, you know, U.S., for the most part, U.S. Uh, historical. Vintage, yeah. yeah, vintage clothing. Uh, and then there was one group of Swedish uh, ex-paratroopers that went in another plane, but they were on the ground with us. And, and when we landed, they fed us some wonderful Swedish food and some really <laughs> strong Swedish liqueur. <laughs> and, and then at that point, we've landed and we've got front row seats to the big military drop. Wow. Uh, which is which is something that anybody can can go see, and and I highly recommend that. Uh, so we just kind of hung out there and, and watched that. Uh, and uh, and that's for the anniversary. That's for the anniversary. Yeah, I don't right. think they do anything like that. Uh, I think they do something for an anniversary of a big drop in Holland in September as well. And mm -hmm. um, so but where, I think that's, where's the best place to go see the big drop? Well, it's there's this one bridge that's the causeway, the Lafayette Causeway, okay. that crosses the river, and pretty much everybody's lined up on that bridge and you know we were actually on the field because because we landed there um mm -hmm. but most people are right on that road and it overlooks it and looks the planes flying overhead and then on the other side of that road there's a monument the iron mike monument that's kind of a monument to the battle there and usually there's some sort of ceremony there um i couldn't get over there but i believe there was a four-star general um that got some sort of was presented with some sort of award or something, uh, some military ceremony mm. uh, that was over there. Cause there's a lot on anniversary. There's a lot of ceremonies at various places. Uh, oh yeah. There's stuff going on all over all the time. I mean, and, and the local tourism board, I should mention that, that in St. Mariglis is a tourism office and there's one in, in Carantan as well. Mm. And if you go to their websites, if you look for that week, you will just see so many. There's something going on every hour, and yeah. you just have to pick what you want to do. And yeah. uh, you know, fireworks at night, and you know, a lot of historical. And oh, a lot. One, one yeah. thing that's really fun at, uh, on the anniversary is there are a lot of old military vehicles that apparently were left over there at the end of the battle. It, the U.S. didn't really want to bring them back, so. All these people restore them. All these reenactors restore them. And you drive down the road and there's just, you know, Jeeps going by left and right, uh, <laughs> painted in olive drab. And, and then, you know, a half track, which is this, you know, tracked vehicle with two front wheels um, and all sorts of things that you never see in the States that these people just privately own. And they bring them from all over France and England and, and yeah. uh, Belgium. And, and they'll sometimes get, you know, get organized and do a little parade down the street or on the beach. And it's that's oh, why that's I say fun. when it's kind of festive, it's it was a very, you know, dark time in history. But it's nice to see it 
uh, be remembered, but yeah. be remembered in a good light and something yeah. that you know yeah. people feel good about. That's great. That's great. Okay, we've been talking a long time, so I want to yes. I want to close this up with you. Uh, you you volunteer at a museum in the U.S. that the I, World War II museum. Yeah, I do, and it's it's funny because even a lot of people that know a lot about the history have never heard of this museum. It's called the Museum of World War II. It's in Natick, Massachusetts, and it, their website is museumofwwii.com. Mm. And it is really a phenomenal collection that nobody knows about. Wow. And it, and by phenomenal, I mean it's not just you know the uniforms and the weaponry and vehicles. They have a lot of that stuff, but even the the individual items that were owned by by major figures in the war and by individual items. I mean, like Neville Chamberlain's, you know, personalized notes from the Munich agreement, mm. um, Hitler's personal artifacts and clothing, um, Churchill's personal clothing and notes and, and handwritten things. Wow. Um, it, it's just, it, when you enter, it kind of takes you through historically and kind of, I guess the, the way they think of it is World War II started at the end of World War I because of the bad shape Germany was left in and reparations oh, yeah. and things like that. So one of the first things you see when you get in there is one of only 11 signed copies in the world of the Treaty of Versailles. Mm. Uh, that's in this little museum that nobody wow. knows about. Wow. Uh, but it, it's, it's a phenomenal collection. They're in the middle of a, a major expansion. They basically bought the building next to them, and they're going to level it and build a new building there move everything over, get rid of their old building and turn that into a parking lot. And the idea is to give more people access. But um, if you're if you're interested in this history at all I, I, and you're in that area of Massachusetts, I highly recommend you get in touch with them. It's, it's a by appointment only right now, but um, I, I volunteer there videoing a lecture series when they have vets coming in and sometimes historians coming in to give lectures. Uh, uh, and it's just, Wonderful. yeah, if you can't get to Normandy, you should right. go there. <laughs> Massachusetts might be a little closer for you. I don't know. <laughs> Normandy's an awful lot closer to me, and you've you've given I'm me sure. a, a you know I I want to go again because, like I yes. said, uh, last time I was there it was years ago, and we didn't spend enough time. I think we we did three days, yes. and there's so much to see. There's truly there, there really is. yeah. When I first went there, it was it was 2008, and I was on a bigger trip that included England and Amsterdam, and I was going to spend a few days in Normandy, and I was really thinking, I've always wanted to go here, I'm going to check it off the list. And I thought going into it that that may be the only time I ever go there, and I had no idea how <laughs> captivated I would get, and that I'd be coming back every two years. Um, wow. But a lot of people will only make it once, and I'd say, you know, invest the time, take an extra day, um, and, and, you know, get all of it that you can. That's wonderful. All right. Thank you so much. I will. You send me some really good notes. I will put them on the website, including kind of an itinerary that you followed this last trip. Maybe somebody sure. will be, uh, you know, inspired by that. And want In a to, plan. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it it makes it easier. You know, if somebody did it before you, you're like, yeah, well, it worked out for him. Maybe I'll try that. So. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I Wonderful. Agree. Good. Okay, Phil, thank you so much for talking to me and for sharing you, all Annie. this good stuff. And I hope you get back to Normandy sometime soon. I, I highly sure recommend will. It. I sure <laughs> right. will. Thank you very much. Okay, merci. Au revoir. Au revoir. Many thanks to listeners who donate to the show or use our Amazon or hotel booking links on joinusinfrance.com or on the show notes that appear on the podcasting app on your phone. Most new listeners find the show through a recommendation from a friend. If you're the kind of fan who drops our name here and there, bless you and thank you for your help. I hope you have a great time in France. And when you come back, consider sharing your experience and thoughts with other listeners. Drop me a line, Annie at joinusinfrance.com, if you'd like to do a trip report with me. Thank you. Au revoir. This episode is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Non-Derivatives International License.